Now, the first of a two-part conversation with former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. During his 18-plus years at the Fed, Greenspan worked with four presidents, faced financial crises in America and abroad, and made some controversial decisions about economic policy. His new book is The Age of Turbulence. Jim Lehrer spoke with him late last week. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Thank you. The Age of Turbulence, what does that mean? It's a title that I came upon only late in the book, after I've gone through a fairly considerable amount of uh, the history of my tenure and various different uh, activities. And then, as I began to discuss what has been going on in the 21st century with the extraordinary changes in globalization, international economics, and very importantly, the end of the Cold War. And what this type of environment is, is a turbulent financial environment, which ironically is probably, the very, probably as a consequence of the turbulence, creating a more productive, stable, economic and, economic and employment situation. Well, speaking of turbulence, of course, we've got this thing going on, the subprime uh, mortgage mm -hmm. uh, turbulence or crisis, whatever you want to call it. Looking back, do you think there's something that could have been done on your watch as chairman of the Fed that could have prevented this from happening? I don't think so. Uh, first of all, the problem that we're dealing with now is an aspect of the in, is is one of the uh, is a result of human nature, basically the innate characteristics of human nature, in the sense that uh, people, uh, after a period of exuberance, uh, there's a magic word for you, exuberant. I like that word. Okay. I think I'll use it. Okay. Uh, but the the problem is that. Uh, we've had a bubble in housing. And the bubble in housing essentially has roots, as I point out in the book, to the end of the Cold War, leaving aside all the economics that are involved. But the consequence uh, with respect to the end of the Cold War was a huge change in the geopolitical structure of the world where uh, a billion people who had been relatively well-educated, extremely low-paid, but behind the Iron Curtain or in centrally planned or quasi-centrally planned societies started as a consequence of the result of the decline of the, the takedown of the Berlin Wall, which uh, showed an extraordinary amount of economic ruin behind the Iron Curtain. And very quietly, with no fanfare, vast amounts of people uh, uh, abandoned central planning. And, for example, in China, there was a huge move of people uh, from the provinces down into uh, the special enterprise zones and the Pearl River Delta, mm -hmm. which created a huge economic boom, which we're all aware of. And those economics, essentially, as I describe in some detail in this book, created a, a very major decline in long-term interest rates around the world in every major country. Housing prices went up very sharply. Because interest rates were down, it was easy to buy a house. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the market boomed. And the market boomed. It boomed too much? Well, yes, I think it did boom too much. But, but did you let, do you, you don't feel any responsibility for keeping interest rates low? Well, let me tell you, okay. well, we, had right. no, we had no choice. I mean, we're, we're the vaunted Federal Reserve, but this global force was suppressing us. We actually tried in 2004 to get mortgage interest rates up and to put some sort of clamp on the extent of the uh, housing boom, and we failed. Because usually when we move short-term interest rates up, which is the, what the Federal Reserve does, long-term rates go with it. It didn't this time. We tried the same thing in 2005. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Had we done it back in 2002, there's no doubt in my mind, nothing would have happened. And as a consequence, uh, uh, we and in fact every other central bank uh, could not confront this issue. And what I'm increasingly be beginning to conclude 
is when you get bubbles like this, there is no way of diffusing them until the speculative fever breaks on its own. We tried numbers of things, and other people tried numbers of things, but what is different about the United States is when our uh, bubble burst, housing prices started down. Uh, our actual, our actual uh, rise in prices is probably a little below average around the world. But uh, we, as a consequence of having uh, a major thrust in trying to increase home ownership in this country, developed properly, in my view, subprime mortgages, so a lot of people who would not otherwise be able to own a home were yeah. able to own a home. But then their interest rates went up over a period of time. That's when they got hurt, right? Well, uh, the, the real problem began uh, because a very significant proportion of those loans uh, were uh, on terms which shouldn't have been made. In many cases, I think it was fraud and that uh, uh, I say in the book, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, the only area where I think more regulation is required in this country is addressing fraud, because fraud is destructive of markets, but more importantly, it's destructive families. A little, a little bit more about your job as chairman of the Fed, which you've written about extensively in the book. You say very, very clearly and way out front that you are a Republican. You've been a Republican since, uh, well, for how long? I mean, almost all, since you since you started knowing about politics. Yeah, you've been a since Republican. I thought about politics. Thought about I, politics. I've been a combination of, of libertarian Republican uh, all along. Has there, while you were chairman of the board, was there anything that you you looking back on it now that you feel you did because you were a Republican? Well. I have the underlying political philosophy because I believe that markets work and that markets contribute a great deal to civilization. So it's not as though I have an ideology and then I apply it. I have the ideology because I believe that it is the best way of coming at the world and what type of policy. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place, and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. And uh, I've had uh, very good relationships with to presidents. That. Well, I know that uh, you mentioned it in the book, and everybody knew, it about, knew about it at the time, that President uh, George H.W. Bush blamed you Partly, at least, for his re-election law. I think he said. I think he said fully. I think fully. You're right. I'm just. I'm trying to put a <laughs> help you out there a little bit. What is it you did that so uh, that, you, that that he that upset himself? Uh, we started to ease interest rates after the uh, credit crunch in the late '80s, uh, and he felt that we were not lowering them sufficiently rapidly to regalvanize the economy. Uh, the Federal Reserve, essentially, with the unanimous voice, disagreed with him. Were you aware of the fact that this could hurt George H.W. Bush's uh, re-election? Was 